to show you that even though there seems like there's a lot of obstacles and it's all really complicated and there's so many tools that you need, there's really so much work you can do with very little resources in a small space on a small budget. And great work can be done that way. Yeah. Really creative work. Yeah. I mean, because people, people face a number of real challenges. The first one is probably where to start. I mean, what am I going to make? You know, Say so you've got no tools. Yeah. Like, what, you know, well, what am I going to buy first? You know? yeah. what, where, how did you get into woodwork? Oh, I did some handyman stuff for some people and then had a bunch of clients want me to build them pieces. Yeah. And then I made a whole bunch of uh, small display pieces that I could take photos of and yeah. sold them to some stores at very, very low markups and almost <laughs> no money came back oh, to me. Oh, you were making a fortune back then. And that, that's a really important point that money is a big problem when you're getting into woodworking. I mean, you either don't have any money or you, know, you don't want to overcommit to the craft. So. You know, like, if you want to get into scuba diving, you're not going to go out and buy a tank and flippers and all this other stuff. You've got to make decisions about what's important. Yeah, absolutely. And no one really has the amount of space that they want. I mean, I work yeah. as a woodworker professionally. Yeah. I have a full, well, a small factory. Yeah. It's still not enough space. Yeah. And I think that applies at whatever scale you're at. Yeah. So even if you are working in a really small space, we all feel the same way. Yeah. We don't have the space that we need yeah. to do the work. Yeah. And we want to kind of bust through that and show yeah. you that you can do work. You don't need a big shed, they cost money. I mean, I think about 80% of our customers here at Timbercon are working in single garages or smaller. And that's only by negotiation. You've got, you know, stuff and you've got kids' bicycles and all that kicking, kicking around. You've got to move the car just so you can use the to drop saw. Very, very, de, you know, demotivating to get started. Yeah. So, and I think another really key problem when you're getting into woodwork, and again, like a lot of the people who shop here at Timbercon, um, you know, they're, they're either professionals that got real jobs where they actually make a buck. They, um, you know, switching off from day life to get into woodworking mind can be really difficult. Yeah, you don't necessarily have eight hours to complete a whole project. You've come home from work, mm. maybe you've made some dinner and then you've got an hour and a half to do some work. And Makes it hard. there are plenty of ways that you can focus your creative energy and make sure that you're doing good work in the time that you have and the space that you Imagine have. Imagine trying to make an American oak wall unit with one hour available each evening yeah. over the next 16 and a half thousand years, mate. So the solution that we've come up with here is to create a tiny workshop. So you take big problems and make them small by breaking them down into little, little pieces. So they're much easier to tackle in the time and the resources that you've got available. And it, we really want to try to be entrepreneurial about this. Like the entrepreneurial spirit of say, I want to solve this problem with these very scarce resources that I, that, that I have available to myself. And use the challenges that you come up against to really drive that creativity. creativity. And make sure that you're doing good work with you know, the lack of tools that you have. And creativity is a great word because creativity to me is about problem solving. Absolutely. You know, great design is about problem solving. And so these are the sorts of topics that we want to discuss in the tiny workshop. I once wanted to put on my business card, um, problem solver in the physical realm. Yeah, and carrier of things across the room and back again a thousand <laughs> yeah, times. Absolutely. So let's start with talking about your story about how you got into wood. What did you actually have available sure, to you yeah. when you were a young, Whippersnapper of a woodworker. So I started in the back room of my house, which was this shonkily built room that the previous owners had built. It was about three meters by three meters. And I built so much stuff in there for the first couple of years. Mainly, what I used was a drop saw. Huh. And you know, I had the previous version that was cost half as much. Yeah. And I started the same way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was the tool that I was already a little bit familiar with. And that's exactly the, the essence of what we're getting at. I didn't jump in and buy some tool that I'd never used before. My dad had one of these in his shop. I mean, in his simple workshop. So I had a drill and drop saw. And these are still the ones that I bought years and years ago. And there was all of my work was molded into that workshop in using these limited tools and I found ways to use what is inherently a not terribly accurate tool as accurately as possible. So I mean there's all kinds of limitations to a drop saw. They're not necessarily designed to be a fine woodworking tool but I was able to do good work on it by getting to know the machine, getting to know where its inaccuracies lie 
and then managing to work around them and build solutions into you know, the way my workflow and the way that I used it. For instance, the fence on this is one giant piece of cast aluminium, so it can't be modified, but those two planes are not exactly coplanar. Now the difference is only half a degree or less, so for carpentry work, it doesn't matter at all. But for woodwork, it made a difference. And if I was gonna do something that had to be absolutely spot on, I'd put a sacrificial fence on there so that it was right all the time. How, much, how many times did you screw up your cut until you worked that out? Well, they were just, there's always a tiny little gap there yeah. and I just had to keep going back and keep right. re-measuring it. While we're pulling out tools, I want to pull out my favorite tool from the early days. This Makita four inch um, belt sander. I don't know, this must have done 400,000 kilometers in belt sanding. And using simple stuff like this, it's amazing what you can achieve. I once did this brush box, box kitchen in Sydney years ago, and I spent a whole Christmas, my wife will probably still remember this, belt sanding 40 solid wood timber doors. She must have fond memories of that. I've got big shoulders, it was great. <laughs> because, I mean, you know, at that stage, you didn't have a big, a big wide belt sander. No. And there's no way you were going to go out and buy one for that job. It no. would have negated any profit you would have made. And I wasn't smart enough to actually ring someone up who had one and borrow theirs. And that's a really important point yeah. because there are people who might have the tool yeah. that you need yeah. if you just need it for that one job. Yeah. I mean, I have the equipment to dress all of my timber, but I very often will pay the timber supplier to dress it for me because yeah. it's faster and they do a really great job. And so like, there's so many ways you can outsource those challenges to mm. people who can do that for you. If you outsource it, you don't need a big thicknesser, you don't need a big space, you don't need a big dust extraction unit. You just focus on the stuff that you want to focus on and within the limitations of the space you've got. Um, and and you know, think through the problem and say to yourself, how can, I, how can I fix this problem without getting carried away? I remember one time I built a kitchen, another kitchen years ago, and I forgot to order the hinges and I needed to get paid. So I, I took all the hinges out of the house I was living in. You took the hinges off the cupboards yeah, in the house. Got that installed, got paid and swapped them out with anyone ever knowing. So these are the things you do as a woodworker. That sounds slightly insane, but that's no problem. So we're going to have a short break for a second and we're going to, um, I think we're going to run some sort of ad for you guys out there. And after the break, we're going to come back and discuss some more of the subjective challenges that people face. Some of the things that we face in our mind that stop us from doing good work. Everything's in your head, really is. So um, join us in about 30 seconds. The tiny workshop. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to put my giant uh, drop saw away. It must weigh as much as you. I hate carrying that thing around. There's no good way to carry it. It doesn't. Definitely weighs less than me, though. That's for sure. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about subjective challenges. And when I mean, or when we mean subjective, we mean the stuff that goes on your head in a daily basis. You know, fear. Really. Yeah. I mean, I remember when I was starting out, I didn't have formal training and. You know, you see other woodwork being done on Instagram or whatever, and I'm, you know, now I'm one of the people that uses Instagram a lot to put very nice pictures of my pieces up. But as a new maker, all I was seeing was these beautiful finished pieces, and I felt like there was no way I could get there. It's a high bar. Yeah. You know? I mean, I read Sam Malou's book, and I said, in my mind, I'm thinking, this is how furniture is meant to look polished underneath and yeah. stuff. And it's very high level of craft by someone who spent 40 years of their life getting there. That's right, so, and as a new and a new maker, it just seems so unachievable. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, the other, I think there's, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a number of problems, like everyone's got an opinion about what woodworking is. Some people have very narrow views. What's real woodworking? Yeah, that's real woodworking, that's not how you're meant to do it. I mean, woodworking is a universal craft. It belongs to humanity. It doesn't belong to individual people or individual ideas about what it is. You can make good work whatever you want it to be. I mean, more and more, you know, folks are using CNC or more computer um, 
activated. That's not woodworking. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I even know that there are plenty of folks who love working with hand tools, and to them, that is the core of the craft. Yeah. And like all they power got a lot to of time them. To kill, yeah? yeah, that's right. Maybe they're not necessarily making any money out of it. <laughs> that but doesn't matter. Though, I yeah. couldn't. I couldn't do what I do without the machines that I use. And I, there's a real balance there. Yeah. And I think it's important to do the work that you want to do with the tools that you have, and not feel hung up about you know not doing something the right way i think mm. like using the wrong tool for the job is a great way to create weird designs because you're forced to mold into the limitations of some random tool like a giant drop saw that's why or a belt sander yeah the um i think another thing that people really uh get hung up on and particularly the female members of our community is the language that is used in woodworking. It's like, you know, have you ever rung up a wood seller who's in a bad mood? Yeah, I want to buy some wood, mate. Yeah, what sort of wood are you? We've got wood, yeah, yeah. What size do you want? 25, 55, 38, you know. There's a whole language that goes with the craft and you need to have an understanding about that so you can move around and deal with people because a lot of these people who are established in the business are not gonna change. So you sort of gotta to bend to work with them. Yeah, I mean, a lot, you know, in terms of dealing with people who are selling you stuff who aren't particularly friendly, there's no easy way to get around that except for keep doing it, yeah. try a different supplier. Or be organised. Yeah, I that's right, absolutely. Key, you know, like, and, and so, and I, and I think a really big thing that um, people get hung up on too is procrastination. Now, I've got several degrees in procrastination, so I understand the topic extremely well. Um, how, how do you deal with procrastination? Oh, mainly uh, YouTube and Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and TikTok. Uh, yeah. I think it's um, for me trying to break away from the task which I'm procrastinating against and doing something else creative. And sometimes that's not even woodwork. Like yeah. I'll often go and put some creative energy into something completely different. Whether that's maybe picking up my guitar for a sec or yeah. doing some making up. Like I like to make um, lightweight hiking stoves out oh, of yeah, aluminium cool. and stuff and I have some tools in my workshop to do that. Do you, no one, do you ever camp in the backyard or something? Like no, that? I camp in the in the wild when I'm allowed. But yeah. um yes. you know, I might go and make something completely unrelated and then I often find inspiration will come in that moment and I can come back to the work that I'm doing. But I think procrastination is a big problem for a lot of people. You know, it's easy to make excuses of what why not to move forward with the project. And again we come back to that's what the tiny workshop is about. You got a big problem, it's like project management. Big problem, break it into lots of little tiny pieces. Something that's more manageable. More manageable. Keep yeah. it simple, keep it small. Yeah. And then just set the task of, I'm gonna get through today. Today, I'm gonna clean up the workshop. Yeah. Haig was in here last week and cleaned up our workshop. Amazing job, Haig. How are you, brother? <laughs> All right, so, you guys out there, all seven of you now, I think, probably don't wanna hear us going on about this for the whole evening. So let's talk about the next episode. What we thought we would do is, I'm gonna put myself in a position that is familiar to uh, newer makers, which is, I'm gonna make something that I've never made before. And we, we actually had quite an intimate conversation, Patrick and I. I in shared the some of my deepest fears. Yeah, he's like, I, we was, I, cause I always made chairs, and Patrick is a box maker, so he makes tables, flat surfaces, cabinets and stuff. And we brought up the topic of making chairs, and I could see him actually shiver. I've Is never it, ever made a chair. It's, it's I've been a, a woodworker for over ten years. I do this professionally. Never made a chair. I've I've like talked to chair makers and gone to little courses. Hang out with them. That's right. Go to their houses. I sit in chairs sometimes, still never made one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make something that I've never made before, which is a chair, and I'm going to make it from scratch, and I'm going to go through the process of prototyping, but I'm not going to use every machine that I have in my workshop. I'm going to do it here, and for starters, because it's what I know and how I started, I'm going to do all of the prototyping and all of that initial design work out of readily available timber Bunnings from Bunnings, timber. just like 19 by 70 mil yeah. that I can cut and laminate and I'm going to do the whole thing with my driver and this beast. Wow. So I don't need to thickness anything, I'm not going to be using any shaping tools initially. As we move through the process and I've developed a prototype that we can sit on and feels good, we can then use that to like push us into more creative design. And it's really important to realise that design doesn't have to be some unachievable goal that 
only dudes in turtlenecks and nice black glasses can do. I can't wear a turtleneck <laughs> anymore, I just get arrested, you know. Like... Um, I don't think anyone should wear a turtleneck anymore. <laughs> I wore one for a brief time in the 90s, but anyway. <laughs> um, so, we're going to talk about design and try and break it down so it doesn't seem so daunting. I don't think that there's any reason why um, young makers should feel like they have to start with a, a design that's all laid out in a magazine. Now, if that's what you want to do and you see something that you love, by all means, go nuts. But I think it's really achievable mm. to make something from scratch. Mm. And if it looks ugly, you modify it. Yeah. And you just keep building on that. Yeah. Yeah. And John's going to talk about some of his layout. Um, yeah, but when we'll get to my stuff, when you've got a model together, I'll, I will talk about some of the work that I used to do with template making Great. and stuff. Great, fantastic. So this is going to be a really creative journey for us. With limit in a in a tiny space with limited amount of equipment to see what we can achieve. Basic that, materials. Yeah. And not a lot of time to, to spare. Yeah. And I think a really key point I'd like to finish on tonight is that again about fear and getting started and keeping it simple is that the space between knowing how to do something and not knowing how to do something is where anxiety is created. And when you get anxiety, that's where people fail, they give up, and they won't move forward. In the tiny workshop, what we're going to do is try to minimise the chance of that happening so we can all become better makers. And right? show that, there, you know, there is no failure. You just, you make something and maybe it's not going to be perfect. No. But you iterate on that design and you well, just Well, you're going to do this live, mate, so you won't be able to wait too many to stay. <laughs> so, anyway... Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Again, I'm John Madden. Patrick Holcomb. We'll see you next time in the Tiny Workshop, Thursday, 7pm, TimberCon's YouTube channel. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, folks.